Hello, everyone, and welcome to Let's Talk HR. And today we're going to talk about the absolute cornerstone of any business, which is its annual appraisal and how essential that annual appraisal is. Because as we know, what you do for the first 11 months of a year doesn't matter. And everything comes down to that final month when the annual appraisal is due. And you can finally ask for a pay rise because you're not allowed to do that during the year. I'm joined today by Sharon, Uma and Unai. Oh, no, I've said it wrong again. I'm sure you'll, uh, I'll get it, you'll correct me at some point. So that we can try and break this down and actually go through some questions on the annual appraisal and make sure that we get this right and, and give you some actual practical advice on how appraisals should be run. So we're going to start. Sharon, how are you doing today? Long no, day writing a document, you were saying? Oh, yeah. I'm trying, I've, I've written it. I've sent it. The report is in. I am now in the room ready to talk about the joys of appraisals <laughs> looking forward to it it doesn't get more exciting does it it just it doesn't, doesn't get, get more exciting, exciting. and uni this is your, your second stream I, I, I think i think uma's the one that's done the most on it so far are you, are you ready to talk about this the annual appraisal and the importance of it i am i am sharon the annual appraisal is it just a tick box evidence collection look we've listened to you exercise does it work you're on mute <laughs> I'm you, know why, you know why i was on mute james is <clears throat> is that i've i've had such a long day i was i was diving into my sweet stash to gain inspiration to answer that question that's why i was on mute um I, I was saying I was saying that that's quite a big question um, for me. Like I work, I've worked with a, a a kind of range of different clients over the years, and also been a permanent person in my previous life, going through um, an annual appraisal as an employee. So I guess I'd say for some, it probably is. Um, might feel more like a tick box compliance um, once a year, um, subject to all of those kind of, you know, like recency kind of bias. And, um, and I do have a few stories to tell about experiences of my own appraisals, I guess. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way, I guess. It would be my, my kind of feeling. It, it, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. And it can be something that I think is, in, you know, incredibly valuable in the employee experience. But it, it, it's it got a lot of variables. I think I'll just leave it there. <laughs> and maybe uh, and I and uh, Uma, um, if he gets a chance to, to kind of break free from the Manchester of Pakistan to talk to us, then I'm sure that they've got loads of stuff to add. So over to you, Onai. <laughs> yeah, what are your thoughts, Ona, in terms of the the annual appraisal? Is it th there is some benefit in being able to have a discussion about your your work, your career, your opportunities, but is 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 the duration the thing that makes the annual appraisal probably not the best function for for conversation? Um, yeah, I it's a I, I think it's a combination of things. Um, James and I agree with with Sharon. I think the spirit is 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 really good um, if if it's done the way it was intended to. But I think um, over time it has, and, and we can't ignore that it has been seen as a tick box. Uh, people haven't always seen the value of it. I think if we talk about feedback, if we talk about an opportunity to discuss. Um, personal development and professional development and what you know the manager or the organization can help somebody do uh, after having those discussions I think that's really important the problem is those things haven't always followed through the professional development plan that's been discussed hasn't always followed through the feedback that comes at appraisal hasn't always been preceded by regular feedback throughout the year and then there is something about where appraisal is attached to reward uh, or, or, or or incentives again you know it, it kind of it, it kind of de de defeats the purpose of 
the real spirit of, 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 of appraisal. So I think it's, it's, it's things to, to think about. Personally, I, 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 I think we should have a, a structure or a platform to have these conversations. It may be just how we change how we have them. Or even even just the name appraisal, I think, is enough to just make people think. Switch off. Is is there a different way that we should be calling these things and having this conversation? So, lot, lots to to think about. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're very true. Appraise makes it sound like you're a piece of art going to a dealer to go. This is what you're worth. Um, and I think sometimes it's 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 about it should be about a two way conversation, shouldn't it, Sharon? Mm, about like, being able to have a two-way conversation about what work, what's worked well, what you want to improve, and how you can come together to to improve the business, really, shouldn't it? Oh goodness, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, where I see things working really well is where that it is that two-way conversation, and it's and it's an ongoing uh, kind of dialogue, really. And I think that. Um, yeah, and it's about, you know, what am I contributing? You know, what, how are we working together? How are we moving forward? Um, how does that fit with my plans as well as the business and, and all of that good stuff? And I think if that can come together in a, in, um, in a, in a more formalised way, because it has to have some formal elements in order to be able to be to have kind of that business recognition, I guess, which is is so important, um, then then I think it can be really powerful. Um, I, I guess there's just a, an awful lot of variables and things that can can go wrong, and we could probably talk about the stories of when it does go wrong. And I think that that and that probably tends to to take more light away from when it when it goes right, um, and it can be a powerful. Um, experience i guess so moving away from the appraisal as as as, as a name because i think the name just again it, it brings you ideas all right you're, you're going to get evaluated you're going to get things and really what we should talk about is trying to create a feedback culture and trying to create a feedback culture where you're fed back to and you're feeding back to your bosses and everyone's working towards the same goal that's where it really starts to have some tangible benefits to the performance of the business, doesn't it, Ono? Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. And um, I think it's, it's, thing, it's things that we know, James, you know, timely feedback. You know, if, if something's done really well, say it there and then. If there's something that needs to be developed or an area that we need to work on, say it there and then. And I think it's 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 more than just saying, you know, have regular feedback. It's also culturally an organizational thing. So when we're talking about being able to feedback, people have got to feel able to feedback. Managers have got to feel able to feedback immediately, especially if they have concerns about how you know work is being done. Without fear of, you know, nowadays, you know, managers tell us a lot about how they're worried about being accused of bullying or being accused of being unfair for giving feedback. So how do we support managers to give timely feedback? How do we encourage individuals to give feedback to their managers, to their organizations, to one another? So alongside just having the discussion about performance development, what does the organizational culture look like around how we accept, receive and promote feedback and those things are really really important because they will seep into those discussions that we have with our managers about performance so that's 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 a key thing that i just wanted to mention today that it shouldn't be separated from organizational culture and how we allow people to be free to speak up hmm. you, you make a really interesting point there to be honest because one of the things we talked about in in the cost of living episode was um a lot of people are experiencing a lot more grievances and and grievances at work and application for unfair dismissals and basically they're so worried about their household income because they're it's it's been stripped bare by gas and electricity prices that they're trying to generate money from work by these types of bad behaviors and and it sounds like they're trying to make a quick book but they're just trying to survive so actually what you're highlighting there Una, is the ability to 
make sure that everyone knows where they stand and everyone's comfortable with their stand on a regular basis. And it kind of nips a lot of these things in the bud whilst also allowing them to be resolved before they get to that significant level. Mm. <clears throat> I mean, then I, I'd kind of build on both of you know what you're saying, what you said at NI and also um, what you said kind of there, James, because um, I mean, for me, you know, the organisational context, the culture around um, that surrounds kind of this process or any other process or or dialogue that you're wanting to have in the workplace. You know, for me, there's that whole element of psychological trust that people, you know, the psychological safety that people feel within their organisations um, and the relationships that they have with their colleagues or their manager in particular, who's playing a massively key role in in, in something like this. Um, and then I think when I hear about, you know, the, the example that you gave there from the cost of living kind of discussion, I then kind of flip over when I think about, I guess, kind of cultures or environments that um, are quite toxic, I guess. Um, and, and that then, you know, processes like this that are meant to be for all of the right reasons can then become, you know, um, more combative, um, you know, more litigious, more um, punitive, I guess. Um, and yeah, and that, you know, so I guess I'm kind of always trying to think of it from a kind of positive framing perspective, but I've just had some recent conversations with some people where you get to hear about the more dark side of kind of management and, and organisational culture um, so we know it's out there and we've got to kind of reflect and, and, and acknowledge that. Um, and that then if somebody comes into an organisation having had that experience, then they come in with a different set of expectations, I guess, that need to be. Um, they need to be acknowledged and recognised, but also could then impact the way that they it, it engage with a new process or a new environment or a new culture. Um, and make it a bit difficult to have feedback conversations if that's what we're aiming for. Um. Yeah, now we're just going to do a quick test just to see if Uma's, Uma's connected audio only. Um, Uma, uh, how's your audio? Com can you? Can we hear you? Yeah, uh, can, you, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. your, your audio is coming through perfect. Great, great, great. Now, you just put a really important point in our private chat because we, we're talking about, about, I guess, it from the experience of ourselves side at this moment in time. And, and you put a primarily all organizations are here for profit and performance needs to see this. And sometimes appraisals, it's about understanding how you perform within the overall organizational performance as well, isn't it? So appraisals are an opportunity, I guess, to understand more about a business as well? Yeah, I mean, looking at the scenario that we are in and primarily all the organizations that are working around the globe, the, the we need to see what is the basic purpose of the organizations. And at the end of the day, organizations themselves have to do their own performance appraisal as well. As to, And their performance appraisal comes from uh, drill, drills down to the performance appraisal of of the individuals who are actually performing into the organizations. So if we see a bigger picture that uh, uh, all the organizations are there for business, uh, be it a public sector organization or a profit-making organizations, they need to do something at the end. And on the basis of that, if we club everything together, then all individual performances uh, are there for profit also. So now if we need to appraise them, we need to see two very basic things that we that I basically see should be happening. One, um, that uh, not what is get done, that should be appraised, but how it is get done also. I mean, that how part is very important in the organization. And somehow organizations miss that. And when we say that only the last one month is important and the recency effect comes in, that only comes in because we see the end results only and not only not the how part of the of the people that they are doing it how what kind of difficulties they are facing what kind of uh, like in the last couple of years we have seen that lots of flexibility working hours have creeped in 
and how the people are working from home and how they are performing. And then when the COVID restrictions are over now, I think globally, how they are coming back to the workforce and how that is affecting their performance. Now, that how part is very important in terms of uh, looking at the performance appraisals. We, I, we, we understand all that this is the most um, debated subject um, for years now. I mean, there are lots of new formulas and tools and uh, uh, processes that is coming up. But yes, we need to, this, this, this will remain a very debated subject, I think, in many years to come also, because we are all evolving ourselves also. I, I personally, I, I think that my boss should be appraising me as what kind of an effort I'm putting in in uh, coming over to a different city and trying to connect to perhaps to the internet and I'm putting in my effort and that that uh, that should I'll appraise you later for it Umar I'll appraise I'll appraise your uh, internet connection performance later <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so that's basically the, the the two two areas that I I'll close my my argument here that on on the on the thing that there are two areas that we should be focusing on uh, one is of course the result which comes after perhaps um, uh, after a year but the other part is the effort also that uh, we should be that the appraisals should be looking into now Sharon, you put a really interesting point in there, obviously, to build on from Uma's point. You know, we talk about profit and you put profit or commerciality or value. How do you, I guess, how do you define it? And one of my biggest bugbears in an organization is where people keep how the organization functions and succeeds private. Like they hide it from everyone. Like it's this secret formula that everyone's going to steal. Like the KFC, like chicken, it's not. Like if you can understand your component part and you can work out how you can excel to improve that, everyone's an essential cog in a machine. Otherwise, you wouldn't have a job. So, Sharon, what is what what I guess what do people want to understand more on? Is it that profitability level or is it just how they they've contributed to the success or improvement of a business? Uh, I mean. I, I think that there are a number of, um, I think people do need to understand, we all need to understand the purpose of our organisations that we're in. And the reason why I put, you know, is it profit, commerciality, commerciality or value or, or any combination of those, and there's probably more, is because if I think back to the clients that I've worked with who are exploring this kind of area over the years, you know, not all of them are commercial ventures. Um, not all of them are, um, are thinking about profit and loss and balance sheets and, you know, not all of them are thinking about shareholder value and all sorts of things. They are thinking about maybe value in a different way. I mean, obviously, the organizations need to exist in order to be able to pay for the people that are working for them. So there's always an element of uh, balancing the books or, you know, from a commercial perspective. But then you get some I, I was thinking back to a client that um wanted to introduce performance related pay actually and I remember having a conversation with their finance director saying you know like what what's driving that because you're not a commercial organization and the amount of people who get you know who for whom might they might get performance related pay and in, in in the the data that a past performance and how you kind of um calibrate which is a whole different other kind of nest to open up um it's not going to really it, I, you know it's so small i don't really understand what the driver is for it you know kind of tell me about it so i do think there's kind of other things that um are kind of at play but i do ultimately believe it's really important for us all to know how the organization that we're that's paying our wages um, or paying our fees or, or whatever actually generates money and what their purpose is because that's very important for us to be able to connect through to that even in you know and what might see, be seemingly in a, a an obscure way it's really important to be able to see a little bit of a line of sight and you know if not to in particular the economic conditions that we're in at the moment to understand you know like is the company that I'm in vulnerable you know like what kind of things are driving their profitability so that I've got a bit more I that I probably will feel slightly more empowered or may 
you know, empowered in that situation, if I understand, you know, like what the impact is of external forces as well, if I understand more about how the business works or how the organisation works. And I think knowledge is power from that perspective and we should know. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Now, one of the the other things um, only that Uma mentioned was how do you appraise someone that's been working at home and now coming back to the office and then potentially had COVID or long COVID and had children at home whilst working? You know, how do you appraise that in an annual basis? It's it, Some people have worked great at home. Some people work better in the office. Some people have been working in different... How do you even review something like that and uh, you know what james and i think it goes back to what uh, sharon was also saying around value so what what really are we are we assessing here so if we know what we are expecting from a job role and the person that is within it uh, and if we're very clear about what what that looks like at the end it shouldn't matter then how that was done, where, how. I think there are things that are important, for example, like, you know, we talk about value, values, but value-based behaviours. We want to talk about those in appraisal. That people demonstrated the right kind of attitudes, behaviours, if they have they been, you know, cohesive, if they've been collegial. Um, so you obviously want to assess those kind of things. But similar to what we're talking about, remote working, hybrid working, it doesn't really matter where the work is done. The important thing is that the work is done. <laughs> and I think we should be using the same measure for, 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 for appraisals. We're not measuring people on their presence. We're not measuring people on, you know, whether they were in the office so many days a week, etc. We are not. But of course, there are other things that we talk about, don't we, around people working from home. And in so far as appraisals support professional development and opportunities, I think people go into appraisal, don't they? And if they're doing really well, they've got a professional development plan, they're looking within the organisation, where can they be promoted, where can they go, etc. So we know that there are a lot of conversations about how things like working from home might interfere with such opportunities because people are no longer in that space where these things are discussed or they take a certain turn of events and that kind of thing. So, of course, we've got to be mindful about some of those things that can get in the way of people's professional development. I mean, we talk about the gender pay gap and we talk about how women may be more at a disadvantage because they seem to have more caring responsibilities, which takes them away from the workplace more than often. So those kind of things are really important to, to, to think about when we're doing appraisals and performance development sessions, but not so much about actually is a person present, they done the work, you know, and, and if people are not feeling well, if they've got long-term conditions, again, the law is very clear. We have to support people with reasonable adjustments. We have to do the needful to make sure people are able to do that. So all those things have got structures in place to support them. It should never be about presence or, or, or you know, what, 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 what a person's individual circumstances are that we're measuring. We're just measuring the output of their work and, and their behaviours. I, I, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think so often it can just feel like you're being appraised as a person, can't it, in that type of annual environment where they're just sitting down and they're looking at a piece of work or they're looking at something. So I think... Yeah. You summarise it really well, and, and it's funny, isn't it? It kind of brings us full circle. We've talked about commercial, we've talked about location, and all of these things shouldn't really matter as long as the output is is as you is what as long as the output is as what you have been expected to do. That is a really badly put together sentence. I think of a better way to do it. Um, but it's it's the benefit of continuous feedback, isn't it? Uma, and getting continuous feedback allows you to be agile with that value that you're giving to the organization. Yeah, that's basically uh, when uh, feedback, um, uh, I think there is, uh, for the feedback part, there is one other thing that uh, I have seen happening uh, currently. Uh, that is basically the type of the employees that we are having. Um, and, and for that, I would refer to the generations that are now coming into the workforce. Those who are, those who are new to the workforce, um, the young generation, the millennials, um, I've seen them not very uh, motivated by being appraised. 
or uh, by the part of the, the the money part of the appraisal that happens once a year um, they are more interested to get their contribution into the organization and um, and for that they need lots of feedback also i mean they are the kind of people i mean the current generation they are kind of the people who are looking for a continuous level of conversation going on with their managers um, and at the same time they want a continuous level of feedback from their managers so now the senior managers also have to adapt themselves as to give them a continuous level of feedback in terms of perhaps i mean they would be happy if they can get a good feedback uh, every day or for for that matter every hour and um, our senior managers must understand this for that part of the appraisal that these new generation um, these who are into millennials they they want to have a continuous level of uh, performance feedback coming in regardless if it is followed up by any monetary part at the end of the year because uh, it it doesn't matter for them that after a year they would be in the same company or not they would be somewhere else after one year so that is uh, that is another shift that is coming in into our workforce that uh, the young workforce perhaps are shifting very quickly especially into the digital uh, the software engineering companies and digital companies i mean these they they have seen a lot of turnover in their organizations so I, I see that feedback coming in uh, in this way. Now, I'm not going to get us on a generation conversation because I know Sharon has some very strong opinions on uh, grouping yeah. people together in generations. <laughs> we'll save that know? for another time. Maybe we'll do a generation and we'll get you both on and talk about workforce and groupings and stuff like that. But I think one of the things that Uma reference there in terms of that consistent feedback, that consistent knowledge, that consistently wanting to get information, that consistently wanting to know you're doing a good job. I mean, that that's basically creating a learning culture, isn't it? You're, you're wanting to learn that you've done it right. And I think that's probably, whether it's generational, whether it just be an informed workforce, is really one of the big changes that we're seeing away from an annual appraisal. We want people are trying to constantly learn, constantly improve, constantly better yourself. And I think that's with the so much information you're able to get your access to now. You just want to make sure you've got it right, don't you, Sharon? Yeah, and I mean, how, I mean, you know my views on the whole generational thing. However, I think that, um, it, you know, what I can completely recognize is that some of the themes that are seen as ascribed to certain generational kind of perspectives are the things that really I think I believe that people appreciate in a good um, learning culture you know feedback culture organizational culture that that treats me like an individual that makes me feel supported valued recognized acknowledged for what the contribution that i'm making um I, you know i think that that is uh, yeah i mean i i'm kind of i'm here for that <laughs> you know i'm here for that whether people want to kind of ascribe it to certain things and po and that's been you know if i think back to my um my career you know that's that's what i wanted you know i wanted to be i would just wanted to have my work acknowledged um you know on a regular basis didn't really need the end of year um kind of process to to, to kind of trigger that wanted that um wanted to kind of see where i was going so i'm kind of i'm all for that <laughs> you know like um bring it on <laughs> and make it happen but I think that's the tricky thing is the embedding that learning culture and ensuring that it perpetuates and that people are investing in it, both individuals and their kind of um, and and the people responsible for making it happen. I think that's, you know, that's where the hard work is. And um, yeah. One of the things that really annoys me about annual bonuses and stuff like that and. and uh, oh, no, you mentioned it earlier is to do with the fact that this is where you see one of the biggest differences in gender pay. Men will ask for a pay rise whenever the hell they want the data shows. 
and they will ask. I think it's sixty three percent will ask for a pay rise when they want to ask for it, and it was a crazy. I think it was like eighty percent of women will ask for a pay rise on the review. So if you've got people that are constantly badgering, we want a pay rise, and a company's doing well on quarter one or quarter two, they're more likely to get it than if it's a bad year end. And that's one of the biggest things, I think, when you've got an annual review, and that's when people ask for pay rises. A lot of people are too scared to just ask mid-year. Um, and that's where I think a lot of the gaps can come. It's not necessarily performance. I'm not going to ask anyone to comment on that because, again, yeah. I think certain divisive subjects it's worth to just say this is what you can find the research on the people management website uh also women are more likely to ask for a, a, a flexing hours throughout the year than men but that's mainly if they're you know that's normally family situations and stuff like that there's some great it's a great survey it's on the people management website just search for men more likely to ask for pay rise and it'll pop right up for you right at the near the top of google but so also james just go just going back to what sharon was saying so you know we found that when when we looked at the salary nego the starting salary negotiation you know uh, uh, opportunities mm. the organization we looked at actually men were more likely to negotiate a higher salary than women were mm -hmm. and the consequence then was during the appraisal process which was linked to bonuses People often saw that as an opportunity to correct where they had felt not able to negotiate a starting salary for whatever reason. So this appraisal process was an opportunity to correct that by, by getting a bonus. But then again, we get into the whole conversation again that sometimes women are more, and there is there is evidence to, to, to substantiate this. You know, men are more likely to say, you know, I've done this and I've done that and I can do this and I can, I can do that. Whereas women are more, less likely to be forward with their achievements and what they've done and kind of look at it and 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 and, and not be as as um uh, i don't know as 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 confident to put it out there as as uh, the male colleagues may be so it's it's a circle that keeps you know going round and round and i think it's just recognizing how appraisal systems can actually put in place structures to support those kind of pitfalls that we're likely to fall into if we're ever going to sort out the whole gender pay gap appraisal has got a good a big a big role to play in, in, in all of that i completely agree and and you know all i all i can talk about from that experience is is between myself and my wife she looks at a job description and finds the one thing that she's not got experience yeah. of and i just argue the hell well if you can do 99 percent of it why don't you just apply for the bloody thing she's like oh, no no you see because that that says it's in it's in the uh, desired and i don't have it or i don't feel comfortable that i've managed you know that size of team even though i've managed this size of team well, i thought well swear on this but just apply because believe it or not most people won't take everything that's on a job description it's an idealistic list and you know that that's my experience of it um with myself and my wife so uh, what you've described i would be more likely to just go to sod it if it comes back great she would never do it never 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 um without a very big kick up the ass which again will save for not violence by the way i don't think oh, actually maybe i should Anyway, different point. Um, so how can we do better, Uma? How can we do better in appraisals? How can we do better in reviews? What should we be doing to be better? Yeah, uh, it's pretty interesting things. I mean, um, I've been learning a lot from your sites in terms of what their <clears throat> feedback mechanism should be there. Um, what we should be doing better, I, I think the, the the area where the engagement of the of the individuals whom we are appraising that is very important, um, and looking at the personalities and needs of the individuals. Uh, not everyone is uh, like uh, we all agree. In fact, that money part is is not uh, is not a biggest motivator, but yes, it is there. Everyone is doing work for for that, uh, but that comes once in a year for most organizations. Sometimes it comes twice also in terms of bonuses or in terms of any other benefits. But the other part, which we all uh, understand in terms of uh, 
perhaps in, in terms of our own needs is is the regular motivation that we need to get um, as to how we should why should should I be getting up in the morning and going to the office and uh, uh, what would be in store for me today uh, will there be a boss sitting and asking me to do this 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 or or will he be coaching me also or he will be providing me all the resources as well so that one part which perhaps now coming up uh, at least in our part of the world is is um, and i'm sure it was earlier in the other parts that the coaching part and um, the pe people who are leading the show they have to show up uh, every day and they have to lead as as models like all the uh, perhaps all the family owned businesses i mean this is uh, this is another structure happening uh, around the world um and and it is more so in pakistan in fact that all the family owned businesses they are more concerned about all these uh, engagements and motivation of the staff and people who are working with them they are spending more time with them i mean they are more engaged with all the family owned businesses i mean since the family owned the, the person who is leading the show he is right in front of them and uh, they regularly show up they regularly are there i've seen that i mean it, it's it's my personal experience um, you might you, your experience must be different or maybe different and that all those people who are actually running the show the the owner of the company who is sitting there people are more engaged with that person i mean and they are not uh, in terms of um, uh, they know that their salary will be raising after one year and they are more concerned that they are making that owner happy every day so that is and the owner is happy from them and they an owner is making them happy because he shows up every day and he pats them on the back and he he tells them that okay i will take care of your this need or this need or this need and then they are okay with with that individual and that company so they are happy with that kind of so for me what should coming should be coming up is that we as managers or individuals uh, must be more concerned or in line with with all the people that we are dealing with i mean taking care i mean we this is this is something which is which is established over the years that people need more of the connection um, and that connection comes when we coach them and when we become their growth partners and as hr individuals we should be growth partners of everyone who is into the organization and once who you are growth partners of them they see that their careers are developing their uh, their worth is is moving ahead as a person as an individual or as a professional and then they would be more uh, kind of appraised in that sense that their worth is increasing mm -hmm. sharon how can we do better I know we almost covered a lot, and, and that was a brilliant answer. So you know, no pressure. <laughs> um, I think um, how can we do better? I think obviously make it more of a dialogue on a regular basis, um, a supportive. I mean, a, a supportive relationship um, around feedback. I think around the conversation. Um, for me, it, it has to be an ongoing conversation. Um, otherwise, I think that any value of any decisions based on the back of it, whatever they are, um, feels undermined um, because there's not, um, it doesn't feel like there's an ongoing investment um, in the relationship in order to make some decisions at the end of year or at a point in time. So I think, yeah, dialogue, ongoing, um, the, the faith in, and trust in the relationship that, that, that is taking place, I think, is really important. Um, I also think that um, often I see people investing in a lot of learning or development or training for, um, for, for a manager, for example, or conversely, making it all about the individual driving the conversation. Um, and not really acknowledging the positional power that's involved or that one person has, um, you know, should have a, um, 
you know it's part of their role you know if you're not you know if you're a manager and a leader has an additional responsibility and and um requirement to be to be engaging in this kind of stuff um so kind of trying to say well it's all employee driven or individual driven really doesn't sit well with me either so i think it, the partnership the conversation the dialogue the ongoing nature um you know supporting both um both people and i think being able to handle that developmental or um feedback or feedback where it's a difficult conversation and handling that and receiving it listening to it acknowledging it developing it but also being able to be in a conversation like that i think needs support and development for both the both of the people that are in there and um, so yeah i think all of those are the key ingredients for me no no what 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 do you think we should be doing better um, I think three main things for me, James. The first one is let's just be clear about, you know, people's objectives. Let's just be clear about what we are, you know, what we are saying we, we want to see, that the values, the behaviours that we expect, whether it's the values, um, you know, like I said, the objectives. Let's 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 strip it down. Just a few clear objectives, that's one thing. The second thing is let's make it about quality of the conversation rather than the quantity or just the, the, the exercise and things that we can do to help that is just make the process as lean as possible, make the paperwork as lean as possible. You know, it doesn't have to be reams and reams of paper. We shouldn't be expecting people to be writing pages and pages of evidence, etc. How can we just have a quality focused conversation? And it goes back again to how we're having those conversations regularly in the year, which makes the last one easier to have quality focus because you're just basically reviewing the conversations we've had over the past year. And the last thing I'll say is, as Sharon was saying, it's got to go somewhere. So quite often we are doing these things to support people's professional development. Then what? So when we've identified the appraisal that somebody would like to do A, B, C, D, and E, the work of promotion, whether internally or externally, how do we make that happen? How do we make sure we're creating opportunities internally for people to move into, whether laterally, upwards, etc.? How do we make sure that we are actually following through with what we are committing to in appraisal when people have told us where they want to go with their careers? Those are the three key things that I'll say for now. Thank you. Now, to, to finish on something a little bit different and um, to really set myself up for, for something that's going to be difficult, what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and build a new appraisal process live on the call. So we're going to talk about, I'm going to break it into five key elements and then I'm going to try and design it up after this, which you'll be able to find so this this could get very messy or it could look brilliant but we will see we've got three brilliant minds we should be absolutely fine so and this is going to be just sort of you've been asked last minute board meeting we need to work out how this appraisal process is because i'm looking at this feedback and it's shocking how can we do it how can we make it better so we're going to come up with some suggestions on what we could do now the first is obviously Oh, no, you mentioned quality of conversation, but to give someone an idea of how it should be, you know, are we wanting a coaching culture, a mentoring culture, a strengths based discussion, a feedback based discussion? Um, what sort of what, what should be the tone of our appraisal feedback, do you think, in this design? Um, I think. Sharon said something really important. It's 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 partner. It's partner partnership. It's a partnership, um, isn't it? The appraisal discussion. So um, I think there should be, you know, opportunity for both people in that conversation to actually amply say what they've got to say about um, um, about the discussion. Um, and again, without fear of judgment, fear of reprisal, fear of consequences, that sort of thing. And 
you know, confidence on, on both ends, whether it's the manager confidence to, to say, to give feedback that is constructive and confident, confidence on the part of the individual to actually, you know, challenge, push back on some of that and, and offer alternative view. Um, but, but that willingness to, to, to come to an agreement on what, what needs to go forward. So that partnership, real partnership approach would, would be key. And it's not about who owns the process. It's 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 co-owned, um, mm. co-delivered. Co mm. okay. So, yeah. just to just to go back, it's a partnership that both need to agree on. It's co-owned, uh, and it should be done without fear and with confidence. That's that's the the sort of tone that we're going for. Um, Sharon, regularity in terms of what the board will collect so this we expect this to happen by the sounds of it this seems like it's going to be a continuous thing but how often should it be noted down when should things be happening how often should we see information well i think that i mean obviously that, isn't it? i i think it needs to be i mean i would say as regular as needed in for, for those for the people concerned um, but w what would I expect to see? I guess I want to see that, you know, if I was in the board, on the board, I would be expecting, I want to see some evidence that my leaders and managers are taking this seriously on a fairly regular basis. So I would say I'd like a kind of, you know, a note of, a note of the check-in at a, at a reasonable period of time. So that might be quarterly, for example. You might want to shift it so it's not, quarter end you know like if you're in a financial driven organization or yeah. a sales driven organization but i think you know i kind of see it's kind of if i was looking down from the helicopter i want to be like i want to know that you guys are all in, you know involved in this taking it seriously co-creating it so just show me a little show me some check-in info um on a fairly regular basis so let's say every quarter but you know shifting it but so an evidence like an evidence base every quarter. But if 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 for example you're learning something new and you're doing it quite regularly and you're working together and you're trying to build something and you might see it a little bit more as, as that co-creation of feedback happens, so that the company can see more feedback about how this new project's going along and stuff like that. Makes hmm. sense. And that way it fits in with what Uma mentioned with regards to the commerciality and the and the performance of it. So you're trying to sort of God, how am I going to design this? Um, <laughs> so you've got multiple things going on. Okay. The next part that I was going to ask is in terms of... Can I add something? We... James, yeah. Go on, Uma, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I think most of the things are covered, but one thing that uh, perhaps you could add further um, from my background, in fact, it, it it comes very often. The cultural development, the the all of these things in the organization, the culture has to be conducive for developing all these things. If mm -hmm. the if the organizational culture is not helping a regularity of the of this conversation or the quality of this conversation, then we would be in trouble. So the culture development that this has to happen must be there uh, just just one uh, sent from me <laughs> that's a quick thing no I, th I think that that pretty much starts it doesn't it because if, if you're going to be part of that organization the organization culture is almost the central theme of it and that way mm. everyone has the ownership of the culture of the organization because culture only works if everyone's in it together so it kind of yeah. makes sense well that does make sense actually and that actually helps with a bit more of the framing um where do we where do we sit on the sorry sorry to cut you but you said the right word in terms of ownership once the culture is there the the ownership uh, from not only the board but from all the leadership in the, the organization that is very important mm -hmm. so the ownership is 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 key ingredient of all these things perfect 360 feedback I'm a big fan, but it can be very exposing for people at times. Um, and maybe it should only happen at certain levels where you've got people below you, above you, and sort of thing. And do we think that should be part of a really good appraisal structure, or is that more a 
for a subset of people. I'll let anyone answer that. Yeah, it, it, it is. Uh, let me go first. I mean, <laughs> and I would love to listen from both the ladies. Um, 360 is, is a wonderful tool. But uh, again, I think that is uh, a cultural issue for us. I mean, uh, speaking on my on in this part of the world. Um, and uh, once uh, Ona was saying also that there is a fear of, uh, uh, of the things also. So 360 degree feedback comes with a fear as well. So there is a cultural issue. The organization, the board has to get rid of that fear from the organization. If that fear is out, then the 360 degree feedback is perfect into the organization. Now, with our little structure so far, what we haven't plugged in is request for training or any reward. And it doesn't have to be financial reward, but... I, I'm separating learning and you know developing and and reward into two separate things because I think one is a I want to help you improve this business and one is congratulations these are the things that we've done well as a business etc cetera, etc. Cetera. How do you include that into a regular feedback sort of loop? How do you make it available for people, Sharon? Um, I think. Um... I keep giving you the difficult ones. I do it on purpose, to be honest, Karen. I, I guess. I guess it depends. For me, it depends on. Um, I think that so lots of businesses that I've um, kind of worked with maybe have a more traditional end of year kind of review, end of year review of um, of the reward. Whereas I think that then some of them some of the other businesses that I've worked in have a much more kind of flexible approach, I guess. And so they might do a recognition or a, a, a spot bonus or a, a gift or, you know, um, I, and I guess it depends on the, cult. for me, it links to the culture and what the, the actual business is about. Um, I think that is the key driver for it. Um, rather than thinking it's got to be a specific formula, I guess, is what I would say. It's quite vague. Um, no, that, I, can, I can do that. Yeah, I think I think you've got to, for me, it fits in with the whole, um, you know, what are you trying to achieve? Um, and I also think that we can't forget the power of um, recognition, acknowledgement, praise, thanks, <laughs> you know, um, things for um i think that we often can forget um and and positive feedback you know on a regular basis which which all i think are rewarding for an individual to receive over and above you know assuming that their pay is fair and um yeah, re receiving a, an email from a director just saying, look, we've seen how well you've been doing out of the blue. You know, as, as Uma mentioned, you know, the transparency of an owner or, or someone senior, if they're recognising what you're doing, for a lot of people, it's very special, isn't it? To just get that recognition. And, that's and simple think, yeah, and I would say that, you know, just recognition from a fellow colleague. Um, thanks so much for that work that you did. I mean, I try and look for those opportunities. Um I, I guess probably because if I join an organisation, I'm not necessarily there. I'm not part of the formal structure, etc. And and I notice if somebody's helped me, or the quality of their work has been really interesting, or or the impact that they've had in in a session that I've been in, for example. I don't know. Any it could be anything. And um, and the power of being able to reflect that back and say, I you know I appreciated you in that moment. You the impact that you had on me is this. I, I think that we often forget um, the power of actually being seen and valued um, in our everyday life. So, I, you know, I'm kind of all for that. Um, no, no, what about training? How, how do we fit training into this? How do we fit the, the development? Is, is it a continuous thing that the organization do but more formalized training probably fits within the reward structure or I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to fit it in really 
I, I think so. I think there are, and I'm not a, a learning and development expert, but I think there, there are probably two strands, possibly more. So obviously the training would come into play if we, if there were development areas, for example, that would help somebody, um, you know, build or consolidate in the area that we, we you know, we would want them to for, for the purposes of meeting objectives for the business. So that come, that goes without saying, but it's it's where you know, there is that opportunity to identify that this is the type of training that is relevant to support this person to be able to do that. And then, of course, people often have aspirations. Sometimes they're not linked to the business. Sometimes people are in certain work while they're, you know, making their way towards a different career. And what if we, and some people may have, you know, very specific, continuous professional development needs. And I think sometimes it can be very difficult for organizations because they have to think about how do they support some of those um, CPD needs. Um, and, and sometimes we have talked about the organization saying, actually, we're not going to fund this program because it's got nothing to do with your role and we can't see how that's going to benefit us as an organization. I think, is there a different conversation to be had uh, around that? And sometimes it's not even just about the money, it's just enabling somebody the opportunity to explore those other things that help them towards those longer term career aspirations. So being flexible with time off so people can attend courses, you know, being flexible with working patterns, uh, you know, signposting people to, to other people in the organization or externally that can help them with conversations, creating opportunities for mentoring, um, coaching, etc. So it doesn't have to be about money spent. Mm. But the important thing is that in that appraisal discussion, when you're discuss when we're discussing that continuous professional development need, again, it's really got to go somewhere. It's got to be meaningful for an individual and you kind of have to follow through as an organization in terms of how we're going to support that. So mm. again, something very important about what we commit to in appraisal, because it's very people hold on to that, don't they? Yeah. If they say, ah oh, yes, we hear you want to do ABC, D, D, okay, so we'll do this and that. And then if that doesn't happen, then it, it, it can cause, you know, withdrawal and, you know, exit from the organization. Mm. So, There's nothing more disengaging, is there, than saying, yeah. I'll give you a pay rise if you do X and Y, you do X and Y and you don't get your pay rise. There is nothing that says get out of our organization more than that. You're completely right. Absolutely. And, and, and I think a lot of people look forward to appraisal. The people that look forward to appraisal actually look forward to discussing you know, real, genuine, open discussions about, you know, how how they've done, where mm. they might, where they might need to, to to consolidate, and what opportunities there are to do that. I personally, for me, that's what I look forward to most when I'm having my appraisal. Mm. How am I am I going to discuss in my my personal professional development plan and what are my CPD needs? And I can't wait to have a conversation about that. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I think it's. Like I, I, I've worked for organisations where appraisals hold very little value. It's just a tick box at the end of the year. Look what we've done. Look what everyone thinks. And, and there you go. Here reasons for X, Y and Z. But I think what we've talked about today is just it's not a tick box exercise. It's about getting involved and understanding the organisation and where you fit in the organisation, getting coaching, getting development, connecting to not only your manager who's meant to be mentoring and supporting you but also being able to understand how you can support them in what they're trying to achieve because you're all working in this together what we've created here in the last uh, 10 minutes is an organizational culture which i'm going to try and design into some sort of framework with my infinite wisdom based on what we've discussed because i'm an idiot um, but I will design something which you'll be able to get at the end of this. So make sure that you try and uh, download that. I'll put it. I'll paste it somewhere for everyone, and then you can have a laugh at my my design. Um, but appraisals are important. Feedback is important. Understanding what you're doing well is important. Understanding what you need to improve is important. Having conversations and being treated like a valuable member of an organisation is the most important thing for anyone who's trying to get feedback on their job. This has been Let's Talk HR. This has been the annual yeah. appraisal. And yeah. thank you very much to Sharon, Onai, and Uma for joining us. We will catch you on the next one.